So welcome to today's Digital Scholar webinar. My name is Katja Reuter. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Southern California and the director of Digital Innovation and Communication at the Southern California Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Today, we will explore how research data sharing and reuse can become an essential and beneficial part of successful research dissemination. More specifically, we will actually look at the practical implication for data citation practices that benefit researchers. So it is increasingly common for researchers to make their data freely available. But um, this is often a requirement of funding agencies, and it's also consistent with the principles of open science. We will look at a couple of different important aspects that are relevant to data sharing and reuse. So for example, the ability to get credit for shared data is, is very important, and the use of open science principles um, through, for example, a Creative Commons license. Also very important is the quality of the data and the role of rigorous community-based peer review that not every researcher necessarily thinks about. We will also explore how researchers think about or should think about completing, curating, and standardizing descriptions that enable others to reuse their research data. And finally, I think it's important to think about how researchers can find data sets relevant to their research. So the decision whether and how to share data often rests with the researchers, and we wanna explore how this can actually be done. So we hope after today's webinar, you will be able to describe the characteristics and strengths of digital forms of data sharing and reuse, as well as citation, describe methods to implement different data citation practices that will benefit your research, which is very important, and uh, hopefully you will be able to assess potential weaknesses that you should keep in mind. So it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. We have two speakers today, Xiongju Park. She's a PhD candidate at the School of Information Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and Professor Dietmar Wolfram. He's at the same school. And together, they recently published an interesting paper on the topic, which I wanted to share here as well. I recommend taking a look at it. As always, we will have time for your questions at the end of the presentation. So please add your questions to the Q&A panel, which you can find on the right side of the webinar. So with that said, Dietmar and Chongchu, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, uh, Katya, thank you very much for inviting us to talk to uh, your audience today. It's, it's our pleasure to be here. And what Hongju and I would like to discuss today uh, relates to some research, as you mentioned, that, that we've been discussing and that is ongoing and uh, is also an area that's, that Hongju is investigating in her dissertation. So the idea of research data sharing and reuse, it's one that uh, has existed for a long time in a number of fields but is also just emerging uh, in some other fields. So for example, in the biosciences, uh, there's been some longstanding practices of regarding data sharing and reuse. But even though it's been around for a while, uh, we find that uh, there is a lack of standardization. And for example, with data citation, uh, it's, uh, it's not something that is, uh, is formally practiced by a number of researchers. So even though there's a lot of data sharing and reuse going on, the recognition of it uh, to some degree is under-recognized because we don't have formal documentation of that process. Uh, to introduce this topic then, let me say a few words about open science. And over the course of this presentation, uh, Hyangju and I, uh, this will be a tag team presentation. So I'll be saying a few things, then Hyangju will take over and we will um, we'll collaborate back and forth that way. So let me say a few words about open science and the open science movement. I, I'm sure this is something that you are all uh, very well aware of. Uh, it is gaining traction in a number of fields. And it, its intent is really to make all aspects of scientific inquiry open to the public and so that it becomes more transparent and, and researchers can be more accountable. And the aspect of open science that we will be talking about today is that of open data. So as data sets become 
increasingly publicly available so that others may also benefit from, uh, from the data that researchers uh, have, have, have made available. Uh, there are issues that are arising. Uh, for example, how do you give credit to the data sharers? And as researchers, uh, we recognize that we're usually not in it for the money, but uh, we do hope to be recognized for our contributions that we make to the research community. And traditionally, this has taken the form of citation for our publications, but something similar can also exist with open data, where uh, data sharers are acknowledged for their contributions to, to public data. And the discovery of these public data sets is another issue uh, that we'll be talking about. So what can be considered research data? And it's amazing how many different types of data are actually out there. So a definition provided at the federal level considers data to be anything that is recorded factual material commonly accepted in the scientific community as necessary to validate research findings. And that is a rather dry definition, but there are a number of examples that can be provided. And again, these will vary from one discipline to another. So data sets that are collected, either representing the physical world or human subjects data, say taken from surveys or interviews. These are commonly uh, available data sets. But even things like images, these can be important data for some fields. Uh, samples that are taken from the physical environment. So in the geosciences, for example, core samples that are taken from the earth uh, serve as important data sets. Uh, genetic material in the biosciences. Software that is developed and shared is also considered a form of data. And field notes. And this really just represents a small number of the potential types of data that, that exist out there. As an example, Clarivate Analytics, which produces the Data Citation Index, uh, which Hongzhu will say, be saying more about shortly, uh, they list more than 500 data types for the records that, that they index. And again, this varies from one field to another. There are some fields where there may only be a small number of types of data, and in other fields, there may be more than 100. So it is a very rich area. Now, I would like to turn the presentation over to Hongju, who will now talk about the five points that, that Katya had mentioned earlier regarding uh, the importance of data citation and its uh, relationship to open science. Uh, data repositories are recognized as essential for enabling reliable access to data underlying research to make your research data discovered by other researchers, it is important to deposit your data in repositories that are more widely accessed by others. In data repositories, you can find institutional repositories and government repositories. In institutional repositories, there are ICPSI from University of Michigan and Harvard, Harvard Dataverse from Harvard University, and Illinois Data Bank from UIUC. You can also find data citation sources, for instance, Clarivate Analytics Data Citation Index Database indexes research data from over 300 repositories all over the world. If you preserve your research data in the DCI database, your research data will be more easily discovered and you have more chances to be cited if your research data are reused. Uh, data site, uh, it has over 2,000 data repositories by subject categories, but some of them are not suggested by made high profile journals. Okay, data sharing between researchers has traditionally occurred through direct con contact between individuals and research groups. These days, federal funding agencies such as NIH and high-profile journals mandate research data management plan for sharing. NIH announced its requirement of data sharing plan from 2003. Like applicants with direct cost of $500,000 or 
or more in any one year must submit data management plan for sharing. Another example of federal funding agency is NSF. In 2011, NSF announced NSF data management plan requirements, like proposals submitted or due on or after January 2011 must include a supplementary document of no more than two pages labeled data management plan for sharing. And high profile journals such as Nature Physics require its authors to make their data and even software code available to readers, which means any restrictions must be disclosed at the time of submission. And Creative Commons research data developed as a result of public funding must be shared under a liberal open license, such as CC BY, so that everyone else is granted permission to read and reuse that publicly funded research. These policies are already in place in the United Kingdom and are coming online at the European level and in the United States. To be more specific, Creative Commons is when you see CC the first one, that means the person who associated the work with this deed has dedicated the data to the public domain by waiving all of his or her rights to the data worldwide under copyright law including all related and neighboring rights to the extent allowed by law. You can copy, modify, distribute, and perform the data, even for commercial purposes, all without asking permission. The second image, CC BY. When you see this CC BY, that means you can share and adapt. In this case, share means you can copy and redistribute the data in any medium or format. In this case, adapt means you can remix, transform, and build upon the data. A journal titled PLUS are published under these licenses, and PLUS journal requires that accompanying data sets should be available in any equally free manner unless legal or ethical restrictions prevent open data sharing. These licenses allow interested readers to use reuse and reanalyze data, which is important step in promoting reproducibility. What we need to be careful is that data sets in repositories may not be referred and data may not be appropriately documented. Data journals are journals that authors should submit research data at the time of review process and should be published to external repositories. An example of data journal is Nature's Scientific Data. In data journals, research data goes through some peer review process because reviewers may read through shared data. Data sharing may be documented in the supplementary information section or web resources section. However, for data reusers, trust judgment is the key issue because of the importance of validity of data. Assessing data for trustworthiness becomes important for data reuse with the growth in data creation because of the lack of standards for ensuring data quality and potential harm from using poor quality data. If the validity of data is not met, researchers may not reuse someone else's shared data. Peer review is central to publishing research in journals Publication of data descriptors as scientific data, which is one of the examples of data journals, involves formal peer review by independently selected experts of both the article describing the data sets and the data set itself. The peer review process as scientific data focuses on reusability and data integrity rather than on the perceived importance or impact of the data. However, systematic peer review of underlying data is not routine in traditional research journals. Data reuse means the secondary use of data, not for its original purpose, but for studying new problems. When it comes to data reuse, there are challenges to date. Granularity means the level of data. Infrastructure may not support data citation. Also, citation of 
dynamic data are issues. Data are dynamic because of frequent update with different version numbers such as version 1, version 2, or version 2.2. For instance, adding new data, correcting errors, and enhancing data quality. Like changes sometimes highly dynamic at irregular intervals. Accessing new revisions can be difficult when new versions supersede older ones. Current practice is that there is no standard format for data citation. Most data repositories only require simple metadata for data description. Many repositories do not provide data object identifier at the time of data publication. Clinical research data that include information that could potentially identify individuals, meaning data sets must be anonymized prior to being shared beyond the study for which the data were originally collected. Although guidelines and processes for anonymization of clinical data exist, publication of freely available clinical data sets remains uncommon. Data citation means the process of citing a data set in the same way that books or journal articles are referred in research publications. Formal data citation means when research data are in the references section. In data citation, formal data citation is in great need. Data sharers may not want to share their research data because data authors are afraid of data scooping plagiarization, and data misuse. And data sharers are afraid of not receiving sufficient scholarly credits, like losing future publication opportunities, or researchers just do not want to share their research data. Um, when surveyed about clinical researchers' data sharing attitude and behaviors, clinical researchers express concerns about inappropriate secondary analysis of their data and patient privacy. Because of these reasons, assigning formal scholarly credit, document evidences when preserving data in data repositories are important. However, there are issues with data citations. Issues are inconsistent, inconsistent practice, invisible citations, and courtesy authorship. Issues with inconsistent practice are due to the lack of standard format for data citation, Issues with invisible citations are due to the current community practice that citations are mentioned in passing in the main text or acknowledgement section. Issues with courtesy authorship are the inclusion of a fellow researcher or a collaborator as a form of courtesy or to return the favor for them having offered you authorship on one of their papers due to this reason, former data citation is in great need. Uh, citation is essential to traditional scholarship. Citation give credit to its authors. However, when it comes to data citation, data citation is not in the same venue as bibliographic citation. In practice, indexers such as Web of Science, Scopus, and Google Scholar lack support for data citation. Data citation index database, which is part of Web of Science, collects research data from over 300 data repositories all over the world and has 7.2 million citation history of research data. However, considering the DCI database con collects its citation history from data repositories, it still lacks support for data citation. Data journals such as F1000 or Springer Nature's scientific data have special sections called data and software availability. Authors specify what research data are reused and where the authors share their research data. Through data sharing, authors can increase their bibliographic citations. For instance, in microarray data, when authors share the detailed description of research data, there was 69% increase of bibliographic citation, which is almost 70%. Okay, that brings us up to our studies on data citation. Now, Katya had mentioned earlier one of our published um, articles uh, that came out last year in the journal Science Metrics. Uh, we recently had another 
larger scale, finer grained analysis of this topic uh, that was recently accepted by the Journal of the Association for Information Science and Technology. So the intent of these studies then was to really examine where is data citation taking place uh, in the published articles. So is it taking place formally where data sharers are being recognized by having, their, uh, by having references appear in the actual reference section? Or is the acknowledgement to the data sets that are being reused, do they appear uh, more so in other areas, such as the main text or in supplementary information areas? And, and the, the implication of this is that unless these data citations appear in the references area, these are not going to be picked up by the indexing sources like uh, Clarivate Analytics Data Citation Index. So authors then who are providing access to their data sets are not being adequately recognized uh, for their contributions. So in this study and, and, and on ongoing studies, we looked at the full text of articles and the focus uh, was in biomedical disciplines to determine the prevalence of these so-called formal citations that are uh, appearing in the references section and the informal data citations that appear elsewhere in the articles. And just to quickly summarize some of the key findings of our study, well, it turns out data cit citation, uh, if we look across all the different fields that the data citation index includes, it is most common in biomedical fields. We also noted that informal data citation is far more common than formal citation. So a majority of the acknowledgements that uh, data reusers are, are providing are going unindexed by the citation indexes. So authors then are going to be much more likely to informally cite data sets outside of the references area. So, and the end result of this is that the data citation indexing services will not pick these up. Uh, what we also noticed is that at data self citation is somewhat common. Uh, we see this a lot in bibliographic citation too, and more so in some fields than others. But one thing that this may be pointing to is if authors are reusing their own data sets, is it because other people who could potentially benefit from these data sets um, are not able to discover the existence of these data sets for their own research? So to provide some examples then, an example of formal citation is something that you would see in the references section of an article. And we see an example here that shows that a formal data set has been cited. But what we noticed was what much more common is uh, the idea of informal data citation, both in terms of sharing and reuse. So when authors are first making the research world aware of the existence of their data set, they may be citing it in uh, their own papers. And this would be an example of data sharing. And then when other authors pick up on these data sets and they then in turn use them for their own research purposes, those would be examples of data reuse. So on the left side, you can see an example here uh, where uh, uh, the uh, data set that is being reused is acknowledged uh, in the acknowledgement section, but it's not in the, the, uh, the references section or it may appear in something like a, um, a linkages or a website uh, section. So anything that appears outside of the formal references area then um, would not be picked up by the, uh, the data citation indexes. To provide a summary of how frequently this takes place, so where are these authors acknowledging the data that they're using? So for both data reuse and data sharing, the instances of formal data citation really represents the majority of the citations that are available. So we see that there are more informal data citations made in the main text of articles or supplementary information or acknowledgements in total than appear in the formal references. And the same is true for data sharing where 
uh, the vast majority tend to appear in the main text. And okay, how were we able to discover this? Well, this was a fairly uh, laborious process that required that we manually go through the full text of each of the articles. And in the case of this study, there were approximately 150 randomly selected articles that were included. Okay, that brings us up now to recommendations for best practices, both general and in terms of authors and what they can do. Uh, we have recommendations for best practice for data citation, data cite, World Wide Web Provenance Data Management, or World Wide Web Data Catalog Vocabulary. These examples help machine readable metadata for every data descriptor. At first, some standardized approaches for data citation are in need. Data are dynamic because of adding new data, correcting errors, and enhancing data quality. Changes to research data are sometimes highly dynamic at irregular intervals. Current approaches to dynamic data are identifying entire data stream without versioning or using access at date. A second data citation sources need to be more comprehensive. Uh, at last, granularity of data citation. Issues of granularity are databases collect enormous amount of data over time. Researchers use specific sub subsets of data and need to identify precisely the subset of data used. Current approaches to granularity of data citation are storing a copy of subset of data as used in a study, citing the entire data set, providing textual description of subset, which is imprecise and, ambigu and ambiguous. Third is storing list of recorded identif identifiers in subset solution. The solution can be to be able to cite precisely the subset of dynamic data used in a study. Current suggestion by Research Data Alliance Working Group is that ensure data is time-stamped, that is, any additions, deletions are marked with timestamp, ensure data set is version, updates not implemented as overriding an earlier value but as marked as deleted, and reinserted with new value, both time stamped. We have recommendations for best practices, especially for authors. As we mentioned before, sharing detailed description of research data, especially microarray data, increased 69% of bibliographic citations. At first, when you share your data, please preserve your research data on repositories that are indexed by citation database. For instance, there is a data citation index database. This is part of Web of Science. If you visit the following link, you will find over 300 data repositories that are indexed by the DCI database, which is part of the Web of Science. Uh, the consideration can be embargo, Sometimes you might want to embargo your research data for one or two years. Some repositories make restricted data access possible. These data repositories allow restricted access to research data. Examples are National Addiction and HIV Data Archive Program, a National Database for Autism Research, the Cancer Imaging Archive, and national database for clinical trials related to mental illness. Some repositories do not allow restricted access, which means open access. These examples are repositories that are all allow open to general public. Examples are clinicaltrials.gov, SICAS medical image repositories, formerly known as the virtual skeleton database. For embargo, the concern is when to provide secondary access to data. The Institute of Medicine has recommended embargo up to 18 months from study completion before clinical trialists are required to share data. Although this has been criticized for being too wrong, 
The International Committee of Medical Journal Editors in 2016 proposed a draft policy for its member journals requiring sharing of anonymized individual patient data within six months of publication. When you decide to which repository to preserve, please use repositories that provide data object identifier, which is DOI, to promote discovery and credit. It is because research data are evolving objects with updated versions, such as version 1 and version 2. One of the examples that assign a DOI, which is a permanent and sustainable identifier at the time of data publication is Xenodoo. Um, the cost of fees for Xenodoo is based on the donations, and size limit is 50 gigabyte per data set. Uh, other repositories that are widely used in medicine are Unipro Knowledge Database, CancerData.org, and NCBI protein clusters. Uh, Unipra Knowledge Base is a protein sequence database that brings together experimental results, computed features, and scientific conclusions. CancerData.org is a repository for cancer research. NCBI protein clusters is a database that contains annotation information, publication, structures, and analysis tools for related protein sequence encoded by complete genomes. And a second, authors need to be familiar with data citation practice. Please be familiar with style guidelines for data citation, such as APA and Chicago style guidelines. And third, journals need to get on board to encourage author data citation. High-profile journals, such as Nature Physics, demand to submit supplementary data for journal publication. Then how will you preserve sensitive research data? Some data repositories meet or potentially could meet the proposed requirements for hosting non-public clinical trial data. Examples are national database for clinical trials related to mental illness, which is NDCT, national addiction and HIV data archive program, which is NAHDAP, and Cancer Imaging Archive. Uh, to summarize the recommendations of researchers, please be prepared to share experimental data with editors, peer reviewers, and other researchers in accordance with journal policies. And please apply the shortest possible embargoes on data. So to begin wrapping up then, as authors who are either making your data sets available to others or as reusers of other uh, researchers' data sets. Be sure that when you uh, employ data citation that you make sure that you provide sufficient information to allow others to identify the data sets that you are working with. And this is going to be similar to standard bibliographic citations where the ICPSR recommends some minimum elements required for data set identification and retrieval. And uh, in information studies, this is very important to us. The way you represent entities, whether it's documents or whether it's data sets, this is going to determine how retrievable those data sets are going to be. So as a minimum, uh, what the ICPSR recommends is, first of all, include the authors the names of individuals who are responsible for the creation of the data set. The publication date is also going to be important because as, as Hyangju mentioned, uh, if you have uh, version, different versions of the data sets, you may want to use the date of publication as a way of distinguishing between them. If there's a title that exists with the data set, provide a complete title of that set and include any addition or versioning number. If there is a publisher or distributor associated with the data set, please include that as well. Because if there is a group that is known for publishing certain types of data, then having uh, that distributor or publisher identifier can be a useful, what we call an access point to that data set. And then finally, an electronic location or identifier. Ideally, each data set should have a unique and persistent identifier, such as a DOI, as Hyangju mentioned earlier. Providing a URL 
may be okay for the present, but as we all know, URLs change. So having a persistent identifier such as a DOI will ensure the continued accessibility of the data set. And uh, it's important to append the date retrieved uh, if the title and locator are not specific to the exact instance of the data that you used. Uh, various style guidelines have recognized the growing importance of data sets and how these are represented uh, and formally represented in, in, in terms of citation. So some of the more popular style guidelines that you will see used in, in the social sciences and perhaps to some degree in the biomedical sciences, uh, American Psychological Association, APA, they have provided some guidelines for data citation or, or data referencing and you can see an example here that's provided. The same is true for the Modern Languages Association guidelines and for the Chicago style guidelines. So whichever is then used by the journals in which you publish, check to make sure that they do provide guidelines on how to cite data sets. So that brings us to the end of our set presentation. If you are interested in finding out more information on the topics that we've been talking about today, uh, we've provided several references here that we think you may find useful uh, to you. And on that note, we would like to end our presentation and give you an opportunity to ask us any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much to the both of you. Um, this was really exciting, and uh, I certainly learned a few things that I should keep in mind. Um, I don't see any questions at this point in the Q&A. So attendees, um, please, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the system right now. I have a question that I wanted to ask the both of you is, if you had to summarize advice to a researcher in, let's say, th the top three pieces of advice that you could give him or her, um, to, to a researcher who is interested in sharing his or her data, what would these three pieces of advice be like, you know, the, the, the most important things that one should think about? Okay, well, I think first of all is identify an appropriate repository. Um, and these repositories may be more discipline specific. But if you have a choice, definitely choose a repository that provides a persistent identifier such as a DOI. And Hongju, do you have a, a suggestion? Um, in it's um, like uh, there are recommended uh, data repositories in its discipline, especially provided by journals. And when you uh, preserve your research data, please uh, preserve where the research data are indexed by database by index database, such as data citation index database. Uh, this is part of data repositories. In our previous uh, presentation slide, we provided a link, which is called master data repositories by the data citation index. Please use that, uh, please consult that site to decide to which repositories to preserve your research data. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I Yep. Sorry, Dikma, go ahead. Um, I just lost my train of thought here. Uh, no, I, uh, one important thing as a data sharer that you want to provide is sufficient information or metadata regarding the data set that you are making available. Uh, if you do not provide sufficient metadata or background information on what is contained in your data set, you may find that people will not find it useful because they're not quite sure what is contained within the data set. Right. Yeah, that's so very preparation of the data set is very important and providing sufficient information on mm -hmm. it. Okay. Yeah, yes, because, uh, yes, because the detailed description of research data increase 70% of cite bibliographic citations. So as Professor Ulfram mentioned, please provide detailed description of research data because it increases 70% of bibliographic citation, especially in biomedical fields. And I see that we have a, a second question here, which I can quickly answer. Could we somehow access the list of references that were just shared? Um, I think you see the, the list of references right here. So we'll make sure we post these um, links 
on the um, related Digital Scholar webpage. So after the webinar, you'll receive an email where you can access the slides, the recording, and all the related resources. We'll make sure of it. So then let me close with announcing um, the Digital Scholar webinar in May. We will reconvene here in on May 2nd. And we will hear about leveraging medical health record data for identifying research study participants. So this is a presentation that will focus again on practical guidance, how to use some of these clinical research informatics applications that are available um, at several universities. So with that, I thank you so much for joining us today and thank you so much, Deepma and Kyungju.